Hi everyone, I'm Eric. And I'm Christopher. And we're Grow For Me Gardening. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about our contemporary cottage garden aesthetic and just a few of our must-have plants for the garden. Well, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this very chilly February weekend. We were not able to get out in the garden mm -hmm. today. Too cold for that. But we wanted to address something that a lot of our viewers and followers have been asking about. It's kind of our design aesthetic. Yeah. How did we get to where we are? Yeah. So we have what we call a contemporary garden design aesthetic. And we wanted to talk to you today about what that means to us give you some tips and tricks and pointers on how to implement it in your garden if that's something you're interested in. Right. So when you're talking about contemporary cottage, there's the contemporary and there's the cottage. So we thought it might be helpful if we talk a little bit about what each one of those two pieces are and how we've merged them together to create our own unique style. When we're talking about a contemporary or modern cottage, does our when you're talking about a contemporary or modern design, you're looking at something with sharper lines, a very minimalist palette, cement, cool tones, very organi organized, <laughs> wow, the words, very organized, um, purposeful planting. Sometimes the seating is integrated into that. You see a lot of squares added into the into the landscape. Yeah. And it's not even so much focused on the plants. The plants are really taking a backdrop to it, which is completely the opposite of a cottage garden. Um, we're all familiar with that. You're going to see all those traditional flowers. As I was reading about cottage gardens, a lot of it originated from people just taking the seeds they had and whatever they could get their hands on, edibles or ornamentals, putting them in these kind of informal beds, informal trellises, informal seating. Mm -hmm. So a lot of curved lines, yeah. um, very soft. Right. Everything just kind of talks together, but it ends up being so beautiful. And then when we built our house, we built a house that is a 50 by 60 foot almost square. And it's very contemporary on yeah. the outside. You know, very, you know, the sides of our house are very straight lines mm -hmm. with the um, the vinyl siding. And just the lot itself is almost a rectangle. It's a little wider at the back. So that was kind of at odds with the gardens that we kept seeing that we loved, which tended to be more cottagey, fun to look at gardens. And that's the reason you see us adding all curved lines into our beds around the house. Mm -hmm. So we're softening those edges. We're trying to create something that there's a little bit of contrast between the modern contemporary and the cottage, but it's working for us. Yeah. I mean, we kind of took what we had to work with and we embraced it. We didn't try mm -hmm. to make it something that it wasn't. And we're taking these straight lines and these right angles and then we're taking this, what I like to call like floof and pretty, <laughs> and we're combining it together into the contemporary cottage garden aesthetic. So you'll notice in all of our videos, when we show our hardscape and we show our patio on our terrace, everything is straight lines, mm -hmm. right angles, but the garden is not. The garden is soft, the garden is gentle, but it incorporates contemporary things into it. So one of the most obvious ways that we've accomplished our goal of bringing together contemporary and cottage would be the addition of our terrace and the patio, of course. They are, again, all right angles in cement. They're a cooler tone. There's, I guess, technically integrated seating with the wall. You can sit on those walls. Mm -hmm. And then even the pergola area and the fire pit, it's, you know, very contemporary, very clean lines, all in black. And then the rate elevated garden beds um, from Gardener's Supply, we stained them black to match that pergola. And I've seen them done in ways that are very cottagey, very charming in sage green or the natural cedar color. In black, it gives them a little edginess. Mm -hmm. um, and we have them positioned again in a pretty um, organized fashion, which 
we're going to be yeah but some of the ways that we then have that contemporary aesthetic and we soften it and make it cottagey is in those elevated beds on those you know contemporary trellises we plant climbing vines that soften that edge in the garden beds on ground around the elevated beds we also have edible things so it kind of mm -hmm. turns it into a potager area on our gothic arch which is the entrance to our garden arch is very traditional like yeah. it's a very traditional part of a cottage garden mm -hmm. but we went ahead and we chose an arch that was grander that was bigger that had a little bit of a peak at the top to make it more modern and of course it's black because we have this repetitive uh color pattern throughout mm -hmm. the entire garden of our structures being black uh we have a little bit of a sculpture in our ellipsis from uh grandin road right yeah. and that is also black but it's more of a modern thing so there is this repetitive repetitive moments throughout the garden that yes it's their traditional elements in the garden but they're oversized or they're black or they're made of metal or things that you know bring it up to today's contemporary aesthetic absolutely so then how are we incorporating more of these cottagey touches to the rest of the landscape? We have flagstones, broken pieces of bluestone and some third, a couple of mixed materials mm -hmm. that are similar in tone to the terrace, but we have them placed in the grass in a couple different spots as a pathway. And it gives a little charming element. Yeah, because they're not organized. They're just kind of smattered. Yeah. And that's been a lot of fun just as we find pieces eric has a friend who gave us quite a few pieces that she just happened to have shout out madison yeah and um <laughs> we hit them with a hammer and whatever happened happened they they started out as big squares we smashed them and then great now they're in the garden in the lawn yeah so we so basically after we have all of these contemporary moments established then we add in the cottage components of the swooping beds right mm -hmm. Um, and in those swooping beds, there are some repetitive flowers and plants that are very cottagey. Very cottagey. Such as hydrangeas. Verbena bonariensis. Roses. Hollyhocks. Uh, delphinium. This sounds like a competition. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in essence, I think in our borders, especially on our east border, you see a very organized hydrangea pattern, and then there's Verbena bonariensis self-seeding itself around. So that's really where it is. It's having those structural moments, but then letting nature take its course and mm -hmm. self-seeding around. And a mix, having the juxtapositions, the mix. You know, if you look at our east border, it's got a really nice curve to it. Our west border is our limelight hedge. And right now it's very straight line. Yeah. That's more contemporary. It's one type of plant all in a row in a straight line. If we wanted to make it more cottagey, which we might, we're not saying we're not going to, but we could add a curvy hedge of boxwood in front of it. And in between those limelights and the boxwood, we could plant uh, delphiniums and hollyhocks and alliums. And, you know, a lot of floof that kind of adds that cottage component. Ooh, imagine if there were um, circular boxwood hedges and a single rose variety in each one with a contrasting collection of cottage plants. Yeah, I mean, sky's the limit. Sky is the limit. All right, so we've talked about design, but... Let's talk about the must-haves for a contemporary cottage garden. Yes. So when designing our garden, we wanted to focus first on our trees and getting those in the ground. And the trees that are kind of must-haves for us in a contemporary cottage garden in our Zone 5B 6A garden in upstate New York. Uh, first one is Eastern Red Bud. Absolutely. It's a native here. I love the whimsical structure. I love the huge leaves that it produces. It's so pretty. I really like the spring flowers and... To me, it's like quintessential contemporary cottage garden. And we have three red buds. Yes. We have an Eastern red bud. We have a Weeping Ruby Falls. And we have a very young very. <laughs> um, Caroline Sweetheart. Yes. I'm excited to see what that does this year. I it, am too. It put out quite a bit more branching for like a whip. Is that what they're called? Yeah. They're little whips. It came in a box and was like folded in half <laughs> yeah, because it was good. so young. And yeah. we planted it right away in the spring, kept it well watered. Uh, and it seems to be doing well. So I'm excited to see how it comes yeah, in this gonna, spring. That'll be a, a winner. Red bud trees. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of varieties. Yeah, all different really colors. Are. We have a couple different European beech trees, which are fantastic because they add 
presence of a tree, but also presence of color. We have the tricolor European beach at the front of the house. Um, we have a purple beach on the side, and we have a red obelisk beach mm-hmm. at the back. I love beach trees. I'm addicted to beach trees. Mm-hmm. Beach trees and birch trees. Yep, and there's another one. Yeah, birch the river trees. birch trees. We have uh, river birches. We have um, royal frost. Yes, and we have Shiloh Splash. We have Shiloh Splash River Birch. So we're repeating the same kind of tree, but in different, you know, types Mm. of it throughout the garden. And then if there's one other tree that we would say needs to happen, it would be a larch. Um, The whole family of larches, I love them. They're deciduous, so you do lose your needles. But we have one called Diana. It's a contorted larch. So even the needles are contorted. And where we have it placed, um, as it grows, it's just going to create this cool, like, how do you even describe the structure of it? It's, besides contorted. Yeah, it, it's it's just, and it, and it has pine cones, we forgot to yes, mention. Yes, little pine Well, cones. not pine cones, it's not a pine. Large it has cones. large cones. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just a great, I guess that's what all these trees have in common, is they have a really interesting structure. Yeah. But for some reason, even though it's contorted, how does the leader know to go straight? Yeah, that we'll have to ask it. We need to ask that, a, that a, an arborist, someone, someone arbory. Oh, ask Diana. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Does, <laughs> Di- does someone know what? <clears throat> why does Diana know to go straight up? So after you've chosen your trees, and we've got our trees in the ground, it's time mm-hmm. to think about evergreens, especially here in the Northeast, where we need winter interest, lots of it. Yep. So my number one go-to evergreen, which I think we have the most of mm-hmm. in our garden, is a boxwood. And we have a lot of winter gems and we have a lot of sprinter boxwoods. And they both perform very well for us. Mm -hmm. The winter gem is a much rounder habit and the sprinter seems to be a more upright habit at this point in time. Um, We shear them back every... Father's Day. Yeah, Father's Day-ish. Roughly. Um, But boxwoods, you can put them in a nice hedge. You can trim them nice and tidy and that'll give you that um, very classic garden look. You Mm -hmm. could just trim them in spheres, which is what we have throughout the garden. We... Love that pop of evergreen interest that it gives. So yes, and there's woods. There's one ev- or a, one boxwood at the back corner of the property. I'm letting it go. I want to see what it looks like if you don't shear it. I'm just curious. Do the one over to? in the corner. All right, you keep, well, it's gonna work. It trust, me. Okay. trust me. Trust um, me. It looks cool already. <laughs> junipers, junipers do fantastic for us in our area. And the, when they're young, they look amazing. I do. I think that maybe one day in the future, when they're older, they'll look a little scraggly. They might, but I try not to worry about that because who mm-hmm. knows where we'll be at that point in time. Yep, we but, have three Hetsy juniper, Hetsy columnar juniper. Yes, we have one, two, three. Yes. Um, the one at the front, we're keeping very tight, very narrow. So that one is probably the most sheared of the junipers mm-hmm. we And have. we do prune them. And when you prune junipers in our area, you want to make sure that you prune only in the fresh growth. You don't want to prune into that woody part in the center. Mm-hmm. But if you keep up on it, you don't get too much of that woody growth. Yeah, and that's really good. We have one that's really, it's right next to the Gothic arch. And it's such a structure. It's such a foundation of that area. It's for privacy. But also, we've kind of cleaned a little of the area out underneath, and there's some ajuga growing underneath there. So Mm -hmm. there's a few, you know. Yeah, and we have blue point junipers at the tip of each fence. We have a blue moffet juniper in a container on our terrace. And we have some sea spray junipers on the berm. So we're big juniper fans. I know some people aren't, but they've done very well for us. They do great in our area. They're deer resistant. They're rabbit Mm -hmm. resistant. They're very healthy. They produce beautiful blueberries, easy to prune. I say juniper. Yep. And then to our biggest evergreen, that would be our green giant arborvitaes. We have eight of them across the back of the berm that were a clearance big box purchase the Mm -hmm. first year that we were gardening. In fact, Eric was at work and I decided I can do it. I can do this on my own. And you did. I did. And I bet today, if we saw that same size container, we'd be like, that's nothing. But back then, it seemed like a really huge project. I'm pretty sure (laughs) at some point during that project, I sent him a text message and I said, I think I'm not going to make it. I don't, I was, it was hot. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. I know. But they're so good. And they have grown so, so, so fast. 
Um, we actually might have to take a little bit of the edges in the front off because they're going to yeah, push I mean, everything off the they, bottom. They are really good about um, being sheared back. They're very receptive to it. Yeah, but there's a, just in general, they're a really nice hedge. There's some of our neighbors have straight line hedges with them so close together. Mm -hmm. And ours are probably five times the distance apart and they're close to touching. Yeah, I mean, part of what I wanted, what a part of what I was envisioning when they were planted was to have them not touching and have them zigzagged and like that natural transition into the woods at the back of our property. Yeah, and it's working. Mm -hmm. And they're deer resistant for yes. us. Mm -hmm. So next we have our specimen evergreens in our garden. And we have, we're like a um, collector. Yeah, we're a collector of specimens. We have a lot of really nice specimen trees. But one of our, my favorites is the weeping white pine, not weeping white pine, weeping white spruce. For years, <laughs> I call it a weeping white pine. And I'm, weeping white. I like, and it's such a egregious mistake for me because I feel like the weeping white pine is hideous. <laughs> so when oh, I yeah. accidentally call it weeping white pine, I feel like I'm insulting he gets it. so mad. So sorry to any weeping white pine fans out there. Go you, you do you. Snuffle up, I guess. I love a weeping white spruce. And uh, they grow very slowly, but for it's gorgeous in our garden. We also have a Tromnar spruce, which is a cross between a Serbian spruce mm -hmm. and a blue spruce. And that has great structure and beautiful bright blue color. That's an azalea, I believe. That nursery. An azalea? Isley? Isley. Oh, <laughs> Isley nursery. Isley yeah. Ner yeah, they're really um, cool. As is our weeping white spruce. And... What are some? Oh, we also have a blue feather Hinoki cypress. That's that, a really cool. Yeah, one. it's grown quicker than I thought it was going to, and it, it really does have a feathery look to it. So be on the lookout for those dwarf evergreens that you know I see dwarf conifers. They're usually really small. Get them. You know, give it a couple years. They will give you shape that you're not expecting, color you're not expecting, and especially on a very chilly February day, I can look out the window right now and see a beautiful little plant yeah so now it's time to talk about the shrubs in our contemporary cottage garden and i think the number one must have shrub is hydrangeas. hydrangeas and i think you need all the types of hydrangeas number one starting with panicle hydrangeas like limelights quick fires quick fire fab vanilla strawberry little hotties all the types of hydrangeas pinky winky pinky winkies your favorite <laughs> uh little quick fires uh firelight tidbits they come in all shapes, all sizes. They take full sun in our zone. They bloom on new wood. So if deer come and eat them or you've accidentally cut them down to the ground, they're still going to grow. They're yeah. still going to bloom. So they're a great option. Also highly recommend smooth leaf hydrangeas or Annabelle type hydrangeas like Incredible Blush, Incredible White, Invincible Spirit 2, Wee Whites. Again, they take full sun. Yep. They come in all shapes, all sizes. They come in either white or pink. They do not change color, just like those panicle hydrangeas. Also, don't change color based on soil acidity. Those change color based on age of bloom, just like the smooth leaf yeah, hydrangeas. They change a little bit. Um, so and they the smooth leaf I am really loving lately because they have that fluffy, beautiful mm -hmm. aesthetic. They're some somehow softer where the panicles are a bit more of a structure. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Uh, big leaf hydrangeas. We have not had a huge success. We've been kind of afraid of them. Yes, we've been afraid of them. These are hydrangeas that bloom primarily on old wood. And as new breeding happens, new varieties are coming out. We're testing some of them this year, especially. And, you know, we're looking out the window saying, all right, come on, make it through the winter, make mm -hmm. it through the winter. You know, this is that family that you would associate really with that endless summer kind of hydrangea, your blues that turn pink yeah. sometimes. When you think of like Cape Cod hydrangeas, those are big leaf hydrangeas. Yeah. And those, they do change color based on your soil acidity. So the more acidic the soil, the bluer or purple they'll be. And the less acidic, the more pink they will right. be. So the new variety that we're trialing is called Let's Dance Sky View. Yes. And we're excited to see that because it's supposed to have better cold hardiness on its buds and rebloom quicker in the summer. So it blooms on old and new wood so that even if the deer do eat it or the buds don't survive, you are going to get blooms again in the summer, which is wonderful. Yes. Oak leaf hydrangeas. These are the type of hydrangeas for us that tolerate the most shade. Mm -hmm. Everything else really likes sun. 
maybe a little bit of afternoon protection in our zone. If you're in a higher zone than us, definitely afternoon protection. But oak leaf hydrangeas tolerate the most shade. They have giant broad leaves that are shaped like oak leaves. Mm -hmm. They have beautiful panicle blooms. They bloom on old wood, so you don't ever want to prune them. Um, but they get huge. They have beautiful fall color. They have nice uh, bark that has winter interests, and they bloom pretty early. Yeah, they're, they're a four, early blooming. They are a four season for us. Definitely a four season um, kind of plant. The next kind is mountain hydrangeas or serrata yes. type hydrangeas, and we have a new variety in our garden called uh, top. Tough Stuff Top Fun, which we have a hedge of right along the pergola. We just planted them in the fall, so you might have seen that video. And they have a lace cap bloom, which yeah. I'm a big fan of because I love that. I love floof. Yeah, love the floof. This is another improved variety. It's supposed to have a bit more of the hardiness. And I am so excited mm -hmm. to get that aluminum sulfate all around them mm -hmm. and try to make them blue. And they're another one that you don't necessarily want to prune, but they right. bloom on old and new wood um, due to this breeding that Proven Winters has been able to do with them. And they do change color. I mm -hmm. think you just said that. And they tolerate full sun in our zone. So they're great. If you have a lot of full sun, look into hydrangeas. I think that hydrangeas needing shade is kind of... Um, old school. Yeah, and a myth in our area. I think if you're in the South or like California, your hydrangeas would need shade. So there is no cottage garden on this planet that does not have roses. Roses are so much hardier than people give them credit for, so much less fussy than people give them credit for. We have quite a few varieties now. We have mostly David Austin English roses. I am partial to those. If you've ever seen or smelled a David Austin rose, you understand why immediately. Mm -hmm. They give you instant cottage romance, but in some cases you have very upright stems. Uh, Queen of Sweden is one that I want to get my hands on. He thinks I have too many roses. I don't think we have too many roses. I think we have too many pink roses. We have, right, and Queen of Sweden <laughs> is a beautiful pink rose. Um, but I do, I love the forms and the different fragrances and the way that you can place them in a group. You can place one into a border. That's something that people used to do. They'd have a rose garden. They'd have a bunch of roses in a row. Why? Why do something like that? Put them in your border. And that's something that we're trying to incorporate onto our arches. We have two generous gardener, a pink rose, um, growing all the way up that Gothic arch. And that's going to give us a absolutely quintessential cottage look on a very modern structure. Yeah. And we mix it with a clematis. Yes. That's a very pretty clematis too. Mm -hmm. So we are mixing in some climbing roses on larger structures. We have some very sprawling roses like the ancient mariner a pink rose which i think might be my absolute favorite and sort of an unsung hero of the david austin collection you don't hear about it too much but it is a star i do spray once a week with um a little combination of a horticultural oil and a um Captain Jack's. It's a Boni product that keeps down those Japanese mm. beetles and we stuff. We do face Japanese beetles. Yes. But you know what? Spraying once a week really, you know, and being diligent with them. Yes, you have to give them a little more love than a hydrangea, but they give you so much back in return. Yeah. So I would absolutely encourage you to add in roses. We've had huge success with bare root roses from David Austin. We've ordered um, direct from David Austin. Yeah. That's what we would recommend. Proven Winners also has some nice roses that we are trialing for them. Reminiscent Pink yes, that's is beautiful. One. And we have Flavorette Honey Apricot, which is supposed to have edible petals. Yes, I did taste one last year. It was interesting when we first planted it in the spring, the first flush of flowers, I couldn't really taste anything. But the second flush in the heat of the summer, you could actually get a little bit of like a sweet apricot flavor yeah. on that. So, yeah, we've got a lot of roses. The one rose that I love that's so cool because it's so different is Tottering by Gently. It's just mm -hmm. five petals. Yep. Nice wide open for the pollinators, and it's a nice pale yellow. I'm excited to see that one come back this year. Very healthy, too. Just yeah. a, a nice, healthy shrub. Mm -hmm. So when we're moving along, we have a couple other shrubs that we think are worth looking into 
Some you might know, some you might not know. I think the one you might not know would be the Aphrodite sweet shrub. I think I'm seeing this more and more in our garden centers mm -hmm. around here. The Aphrodite sweet shrub is huge with huge foliage and cranberry pinkish reddish mm -hmm. blooms that look like magnolia blooms almost. Yeah, but little tiny ones. Yeah, and smell like pineapple. Yeah, and then if you take the leaf and you crush it in your hand, you realize, I believe they it are related like, to allspice. Yeah, it smells like allspice. And it's just like a great, beautiful, full structure to have in your garden. And it's unique, and it's different, and it's very low maintenance. Yes. And people have literally stopped at it and been in awe of it. I think what's interesting is that even though we're, you know, using it in a cottagey way, there's something about the leaves being bigger and shinier that gives it a contemporary flair. I agree. I agree. The other mm. shrub that I think has a bad rap from previous versions or from like the original mm. shrub is quince. And there is a line of quince called Double Take Quince. It's a uh, proven winners and they have bred out the thorns and they have bred out the aggressive spreading. So we have double take orange and you might be thinking orange in your garden, right. <laughs> but they bloom so early in the spring and it's not like a neon orange. It's like a corally orange with like this deep saturated color that is so beautiful. I cannot capture it on camera. I have pictures of it. They never come out as great as it looks in person. They spread a little bit. So it's not a non spreading quince, but it's very slow. Mm -hmm. We have a hedge of three at the back of our border this year. We are going to plant some lavender in front of them. Um, but, and they bloom from the bottom of the stem all the way to the tip of the stem. Mm -hmm. And I love them so much. And I don't think they get enough credit or they don't get enough people are not after these quinces and i really think they should be. yeah they just actually are coming out with a white mm -hmm. which will be really interesting yeah for sure and then the last shrubs that we have are also improved versions of shrubs yeah. and it comes in two really important colors in the garden winecraft gold and winecraft black and it gives you that chartreuse color if you go with the winecraft gold yep. and it gives you that deep purpley burgundy color if you go with winecraft black and they stay much smaller and have a, a more ideal structure than traditional smoke bushes but again it's that beautiful foliage the beautiful color the form of the plant is really what is harkens back to a cottage kind of ideal right. but because they've been bred to be improved they're just definitely more contemporary so let's talk about perennials in the garden. Yes, I think perennials are probably the air, like the variety that I think of most when I think of cottage gardens. Mm -hmm. That and annuals, of course. But I think that the perennials are something we're spending more time with than we had originally. We really dove into shrubs head first. So this year in particular, we're going to be bringing in some more varieties of perennials. But when it comes down to it, is really the anchor of our entire cottage side mm. of our design aesthetic is Eric's favorite plant. Walker's Low Cat Mint. I love it so much. It is the epitome of that like cottage garden floof and how <laughs> we use it in the garden. I know I love it is it is repeated everywhere. And we are so lucky because we get three flushes out of it. We get it pretty early in the season. We share it back, we get a second flush, and then by fall, we have a third, much more meager flush. Yeah. But we're very lucky in that way. Um, for us, I don't ever walk out in the yard and find cats. A lot of people are worried about attracting cats into yeah. the garden. I would love to attract cats into our garden and get rid of the mice. Yeah, that right? would be good. Get rid of mice. Uh, and also, we <laughs> love cats. So if we had cats coming in our garden, that'd be awesome. But we don't. So for us, we don't have a cat problem with the cat mint. Um, the walker's low spreads a little bit. Not crazy, though. No. Um, it it just has beautiful purple flowers and a blue foliage. It has a nice scent. We repeat it everywhere. And that kind of is our, our perennial that ties all the areas of the garden together. Yeah, so there's never a time when you're looking at a vignette of the garden 
where you're too far away from at least some group of three or a hedge. It looks really, it's a really beautiful way to wrap a corner. Mm -hmm. or like a, a circular area Very to have soft. that. I think it's really nice to do that. And it's one of those things that you can juxtapose against the harder lines yes. of your landscape. It's also very inexpensive because every year or two, you can rip it in half and you have two. Oh yeah, you just divide it yeah, really it's easy. so hard Loves for the us. sun, likes it a little, you know, not too wet. Not too wet. It doesn't want to be fed. It doesn't. It doesn't want love from you. It just wants you to love it. Um, and then when it comes to some of our other favorite um, things to repeat, things to repeat, it would be the serendipity allium. This is the perennial kind of allium that comes out later in the season. It's not like the tall. Yeah, it's not bulbs. Ones. It's not the bulbs that you plant in the fall yeah. that bloom in the spring. It's a perennial. Yeah. And I think the reason we like it so much, you get pollinator magnet, beautiful purple color. You get the spherical bloom. But it's on this kind of organized grassy texture. Grassy texture. So yeah. you get a little best of both worlds. Um, those look really nice in groups. I think those were that's something that we've planted quite a bit around our roses. I don't know where I read this, correct me if I'm wrong, but the scent, not the scent of alliums, because you know, that's an onion, but the presence of an onion-based plant near a rose apparently makes the rose smell better. Now, I don't know if that's because- Probably oh, because the onion onions. scent smells so bad. Right, and <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but I think I read like there was some kind of other compound in the air. I don't know. You know I could just come up with this kind of random stuff. Um, other perennials, let's see. We're gonna be doing some- Can we backtrack to the alliums really quick? We have that new variety coming. Bubbles. Bob Bubblehead or Bobblehead? I, it's one or the other. But it's like a paler allium. So I'm interested to see that. That's yeah, coming from nice. Walter's Gardens. Yeah, that'll be really cool. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and so um, we were talking with Walter's Gardens about our problems with echinacea. Echinacea, that is another quintessential variety that you're going to see in a cottage garden. We've had problems with it just not working so well for us. There was a combination of an animal liking to eat it. And then just in general, it just the ones that didn't get eaten, just didn't grow well. So we're going to be looking into some different varieties that hopefully will give us that look that we want. You're so optimistic. I'm very optimistic. I feel optimistic. like we've tried echinacea like five times and I'm like, it's not working for us. I don't know. It like rots or like comes back small. It just like withers away. Yeah. I but have no idea what's going on with echinacea. You watch. We're going to do it this year. This is the year. We'll see. Um, and then of course, <laughs> personally, I think Kukura belongs in a contemporary cottage garden. One of the things I realized when we were talking about what we wanted to add into our um, video today is how you can use the newer coral bells for unexpected color. Um, you can put, they're not, some of them are very small, some get a little bit bigger, but you just get this nice mound of leaves. You can get a bright chartreuse color a peach color, a black color, red colors. You really can add in a nice little textured moment into a full sun area that just ties things together. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite combinations in our whole garden is peach berry ice, coral bell, and we have a group of seven of them in front of Ever After Veronica, which is a very dark green leaf with a very bluish bloom. And the combination of the two, it is so striking. Yeah, and then you add in that Winecraft black smoke bush behind it. Right behind it. And I love it so much. But you That's are a, a coral bell pusher. I'm the coral bell pusher. You love a coral bell. Uh, the other perennial that we love in our garden that's very cottagey, but modern at the same time, is the lictrum. Yes. Meadow rue. We have like a lavender mist, I think it is. Yep which we've been able to kind of propagate. Yeah, propagate and grow from seed. What other varieties do we have? We have Nimbus White. We have Black Stockings. We are going to hopefully be getting our hands on Proven Winners' first ever Thelictrum mm -hmm. called Cotton Candy. I mean, it, we have it. It's supposedly it's coming. Fingers it crossed. Says, so I think it'll be there. So those are kind of our go-to perennials. Also, delphiniums and hollyhocks, hollyhocks yep. which we love. We don't have as many of those as we have of our other varieties, but we had the champagne majorette hollyhock, yep. which was amazing. So and then we had a delphinium that has kind of died out over the years. It's gotten too shaded in that area. 
Um, it was a blue delphinium that's really pretty, but you're growing some from seed this year. For yes, I'm actually going to be starting them tomorrow morning. Great. He just has to tell me how many he'd like me to I grow. I don't know how many I want yet because I don't know where they're going to go. So the options are 12 or 24. Uh, 12. All right. Or 24. Because we can always give them away. That's true. I'll do a whole tray. Great. <laughs> so one of the best ways to have fun and kind of experiment in your garden is with annuals. And we love switching it up with the annuals. We rarely repeat annuals year to year that we've used the year before. Mm -hmm. There is one, however, that's a definite must repeat for us, and that's the Artist Blue Floss Flower Ar Ageratum Hybrid yes. from Puma Winners. Amazing little cute tuft of bright, intense purpley blue flowers. Super healthy, never stops blooming. We love it. It's great to put around hydrangeas and things like that. Yep, and it's uh, it's we use it a lot in the front of the house where. Frankly, you want it a little more organized, you know, that foundation planting mm. versus your more lush plantings in the back. So in the front, we do kind of tidy up the front of the, the or the front edge of yeah. our borders. Yeah, so that's our, one flower. of our go-to annuals. We also got some ageratum seeds, which yeah. are taller. They're a little floofier. There's yep. that word again, that, you know, whimsical structure for the cottage garden look. Um, this year, our color scheme on the back terrace is going to be shades of purple and pale yellows. In the past, we've done coral and blue purple. We've done yellow and pink. And we, you know, every year we kind of switch it up. This year, I think we're kind of going a little French. Yeah, like I like a French this. country look. Yeah, and it's going to look really nice because we have so much catmint going on all around. Mm. And it'll, it'll bring that together. The other good thing about purple and yellow is we'll be able to add plants to our shadier spots on the terrace that work with the color scheme. Yeah, I'm picturing like dark purples, light purples, and yellows. Yeah. And there might be like some like a white or pale yellow, something mm -hmm. a little brighter thrown in, but we'll figure it out. I I mean, we have the opportunity to order our annuals ahead of time. And so we try, we are doing that and we've tried our best, but I like to be in the garden center and holding them in my hand and putting them together and being like, yes, no, you know, so... We'll do some of that too. We'll take you along for that. Yeah, we. I mean, you, you can't not shop. We have an amazing garden center for annuals and there are thousands of plants and you just get so overwhelmed. And usually what happens is I'm holding two cardboard boxes and following you around. Love that. Uh, one of our <laughs> annuals that we also always repeat is Super Tunia Mini Vista Indigo. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Yeah, that one's really nice. You get basically three colors out of it as they fade. They mm -hmm. start out really dark blue and they yeah. fade a little bit. You kind of get that dark purple, that medium purple, and that light purple. And then we're also using, incorporating begonias this year, mm -hmm. um, like a yellowy begonia I think will be really pretty. And then growing from seed. Yes, we are florette stands. We love them just as much yeah, as so many of you do. For years. And I'm really proud of her and excited for what she's been able to do this year. Yeah, it's at, like, and there's something, I think it's going to be special that so many gardeners that are on social media, especially on Instagram, just to see how excited people are about growing her original plants. Yeah. So we're so, growing the zinnias. Yep. And dahlias. Yes. Which gonna, varieties did we get? So we got Alpenglow, the zinnias, which are going to be beautiful because they're going to fit in with our color scheme. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where we're putting them yet, but they, who cares? We'll put them everywhere. And then the, um, the dahlias we got were the petite florette, and I got two packets, which I believe means I'm going to potentially have 50 different dahlia varieties. That's a lot. We'll find a spot for some of those. <laughs> as many as possible. But I think it's going to be really cool. They're just, they're very you know, obviously it's unique because the flower that the 50 flowers we grow could technically be unique to any other zinnia in the world. They could be. And then if we like them, we save the tubers. Yeah, that's which we're not great at doing because I have a plan. We get lazy about it. <laughs> I, well, I have a plan because we don't have a root cellar. So the only other thing I think, well, it's, it's not a think, it's a no. For Bina Benariensis, when we talk about an organized border, and then having self-sowers that shape that and change it and give different looks all the time for Bina Benariensis. I'm not going to start any from seed this year because last year I found a clump in an area we didn't need them, and I was able to replant over 30 of the seedlings. Yeah, and that clump comes from Verbena Benariensis reseeding itself. Yes, aggressively. Yeah. 
Um, they're easy to pull though. You could even do like a loop hoe mm -hmm. and they're gone. Or you just scoop almost with your hand and suddenly you have so many plants to move. Yeah, I love them though. So yeah, Catmint and Verbena Venariensis, I feel like are our must-haves for a contemporary cottage garden mm -hmm. aesthetic. Um, and then of course we need to have some edibles. Yes, we'll have some garden. edibles. We'll have them in our elevated bed. We're going to walk you through that whole elevated bed setup and what we're planting in it. We have a great um, irrigation system that we're installing in them that we can't wait to share with you. That's so good. Um, so and good. then we also plant some edibles in the ground around them. So we call that our potato area. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So overall, that's kind of what we consider our contemporary cottage garden aesthetic. Those straight, firm lines with your hardscape and your home and oversized structures, the black color, the repetition of, you know, certain colors and plants throughout the garden. And then all of that floof and whimsy and, mm -hmm. you know, fullness and lushness that comes from contemporary or comes from the cottage garden aesthetic. Yeah. So it's... I think my suggestion, if you have a cottage garden and you want to feel a little more contemporary cottage garden, maybe you just do a very straight hedge in front of your planting. Something mm -hmm. that hardens off the edges. Just yeah, a, little a lot bit. of it is about that juxtaposition of hard and soft. Yeah, which is, I mean, that also in color. Don't be afraid to have some contrast. Don't be afraid to have contrast in texture and mood and yeah. oh, there's so much. And do, do what you like, because at the end of the day, it is your garden and you are the person that's going to be spending the time in there mm -hmm. and working in it. So it is your garden. Do what you love. Hopefully today we were just able to give you a little insight into our garden and what we love. And maybe you get a little inspiration from it. Maybe you've watched this whole video and you thought, oh, glad I know what that is because I don't <laughs> like it at all. Right. Or maybe you've watched it and you're like, that's amazing. Thank you for the insight. Yeah. So, yeah. And don't be afraid in the comments to drop some of your favorite plants that you think might fit. Mm -hmm. If you do do that, don't forget to add in your growing zone, though, so that other people in the gardening community get a little like sneak, a little insight into, oh, they're in zone seven like I am and this works for them. That's great. Perfect. So, yeah. So thank you for joining us today. Again, I'm Eric. And I'm Christopher. And we're Grow For Me Gardening. Thanks for growing with us.